The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Well, I'm not going to attempt anything new today, but rather I look back on a, a sermon that I preached seven years ago, and it was one of my favorite Christmas texts, and so I humbly offer it again to you today uh, for your consideration. Uh, some of you weren't here in 2012 when it was preached before, and most of you probably don't remember it anyway. So just a little heads up that this is not a brand new thing. But usually when I preach a sermon again after many years, it's, it's changed up and uh, alterations have been made and this is the same. But our text today is Revelation chapter 12. And I, I seriously doubt that there are too many people that consider this to be a Christmas text. I want to call it the cosmic battle for Christmas. This is the conflict between spiritual forces that are outside of this world. This is a conflict between good and evil. It's a conflict between God and Satan. There are many people who believe that God and Satan are equal adversaries in the battle for the souls of men. They believe that God has no more influence than Satan. And the only choice that you make in salvation or that is made in salvation is the choice that you make. Will you choose good or will you choose evil? Will you choose God or will you choose Satan? But I want to tell you that the Bible knows nothing of an equal conflict between God and Satan. It knows nothing of equal influences. Because God is the creator of all. God is the sovereign of all. God plans and purposes every event of every kind. And all of them are under his control. But nevertheless, there is this conflict since Satan defied God and was cast out of heaven. Now, the piece of the puzzle that Satan misses is that God allows him just a little bit of space on his leash he uses Satan for his purposes, and the Word says that he will crush Satan to show his supreme power over him. And so you're mistaken if you think that God is worried, that God just doesn't know, know what to do with Satan. No, God knows every move that Satan makes, and in his Word, if you read it carefully, and even if you read it casually, it's easy to see that God forecasts Satan's eternal doom. But still, none of that stops Satan from trying to defeat God. The most important event in the history of the world is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who is the eternal God. The birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is the focal point of all of history. And we exist in this world today because of God's plan and purpose for us through Jesus Christ. Well, as we look at this text in Revelation, we take a journey back to the beginning of the creation. And then we're propelled through history to a time 2,000 years ago. And then finally we finish with an undetermined time that's yet future. And we don't know that future time, only God knows. But we do know that God is the God of eternity. That God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And in Revelation chapter 12, I'd like us to read the first five verses of this chapter. Revelation 12, beginning in verse number 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now, in the opening verses of the Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle John wrote, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, 
to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. The most important fact about the Bible is that God gave it to us. The Bible is not a fairy tale. It's not filled with myths and legends. The Bible is not the figment of wild imaginations. The Bible is the Word of God. Now, in this chapter, we read about the supernatural. These things that are written are beyond human experience. The only way that we can even know these are uh, these things is that God peeled back the curtain of the unseen world to let us take just a look into it. Now, the Apostle John was told to write these things, and these are true visions of what he saw. But these aren't visions that came from his own mind. These are visions that were given by the divine mind. Now, he begins in verse number one saying, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. The word wonder is the same as a sign. It means a symbol that stands for something else. And so heaven is opened, and John sees a woman that is clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet. She wears a crown and has 12 stars on her head. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean a real woman because we're told that this is a wonder, that it is a sign. It's a symbol that stands for something else. And so the question needs to be asked, who is this woman and what does she represent? Now, since we are talking about the Christmas story, I'm sure the very first thought that comes to our mind is that this woman represents Mary. The verse says that the woman was about to give birth. And the fifth verse says that she gave birth to a man-child, and he was to be the ruler of all nations. So that recalls to our minds two prophecies about birth and about kingship. These are found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In the ninth chapter, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Roman Catholicism teaches and interprets the woman as Mary. Now they look for any reason to exalt Mary and to worship her. And so they see, they read this and they see heaven opened and they see a crown and they say, see stars and they immediately they run to this and it seems to be the perfect text to call Mary the queen of heaven. That's a title that they give to her. Mary is the queen of heaven. But they also run into great difficulty with the rest of this chapter because Mary does not fit anything else in the passage. There's also difficulty because the Bible never gives any hint that Mary is to be worshipped or that she has anything to do with the redemption of mankind. Mary referred to herself but not as nothing but a lowly handmaid. She was blessed to give birth to the Savior, but she would be the very last to ask for any kind of attention or recognition to be paid to her. Never once is there a command in all of the scriptures to venerate Mary. The apostles never mention her in any place as a co-redeemer or as a person to be prayed to or worshipped in any way. This is a sign in heaven. It's a symbol. And so we know that it's not a real woman. It can't be Mary. So who does this sign refer to? Who is this woman? What is the symbol? Well, this would be number one on your listening sheet. The woman represents the nation of Israel. The woman represents the nation of Israel. On her head is a crown with 12 stars, and these 12 stars stand for the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes. These are the sons of Jacob, and if you carefully read the previous chapters in the Revelation, you'll see a prominent, uh, the prominent place of the 12 tribes of Israel. The kingdom is promised to Israel, and Jesus Christ is the king that sits on the throne of David. And when you have opportunity, you might want to take time to read Genesis chapter 37. And there you'll find the dream of Joseph. And in the dream, Joseph represents Christ, 
The sun, the moon, and the stars represent Jacob and Rachel and Joseph's 11 brothers, and they all bow to Joseph, just as Israel will bow to King Jesus. Now, in verse number two of our text, it says, And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Here we see that there are birth pains. The woman is ready to give birth to this child, and bringing this child into the world will not be easy. The cosmic forces of evil will do everything they can to prevent this birth. To prevent the birth is to stop this child from fulfilling God's eternal plan for the redemption of the world. So number two, her pain, the woman's pain, is the struggle to bring Christ into the world. This is the struggle. The pain is the struggle to bring Christ into the world. In just a few minutes, we'll take a quick tour through the history of Israel and see how difficult it was for Christ to come. The promise that God would send a Redeemer was given first in the Garden of Eden. And only three chapters into Genesis, the world was already in need of a Savior. Bible scholars differ about how long that Adam lived in the Garden of Eden before he sinned. But almost all are agreed that it was a short time that the world was in existence only briefly before man rebelled against God and sealed to himself a curse. Scripture says that the wages of sin is death, and spiritual and physical death are the rewards for Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. God told Adam, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, in the day that you eat, you will surely die. And Adam ate, and he was cursed, and death was the result. At that moment, Adam died spiritually, and then his body began to die physically, and because of Adam's sin, the whole world is cursed with death. Now, do I need to tell you who is behind the temptation and the fall of Adam? It was the cosmic forces of evil as Satan already started his war against God's perfect plans. And friends, the curse endures to this very hour. Each of us is born in sin. We are all born with the curse of death on us. Every person is born in spiritual death. We are all on the way to physical death. So spiritually, we are born dead. And from the moment that we take our first breath, we are headed for the inevitable of physical death. There is no one who gets out of this world alive. But we thank God that he's gracious and he's merciful. He knew what would happen in the garden. He knew what Satan would do. He created man knowing what Adam would do. And God already had a plan in place to lift the curse and to bring his creature, Adam, man, back into fellowship with him. His plan was Jesus. His plan that a child would be born. His plan was Christmas. But it wasn't a plan without strong opposition. Cosmic forces were at work to destroy this plan. Now, there was a special nation that was chosen to bring Christ into the world. This is Israel, and Israel would give birth to the Messiah. And so Israel was put squarely into the crosshairs of the most powerful forces of evil that wanted to prevent this birth. Now, that brings us to verses 3 and 4 in our text. It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and had cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now the next sign that John saw was a great red dragon. Great refers to the extent of his power, that he's more powerful than any other creature. Oh, this is a frightening sight. This dragon has seven heads and has ten horns, and those are also symbols. Now remember, this word wonder, that means a sign. It's a symbol of something. And there's much, much more here uh, in this text that we can tackle in one sermon, but I can tell you that the seven heads refer to seven great empires that would come into existence. The ten horns represent the power of the confederation of nations in the end times that will be controlled by the Antichrist. And all of these had the same purpose in mind. It is either to stop Christ from being born or stop him from completing the eternal plan of God. 
The dragon is explained in verse number 9, if you want to look there. This dragon is that old serpent who is called the devil. He is Satan. He's the fallen angel Lucifer, who from the beginning was the chief architect of this cosmic battle against Christ. So we go back to the woman and we see, number three, is that her great enemy is the fallen angel Lucifer. The enemy is the fallen angel Lucifer. The vision that John has in verses 3 and 4 is of a scene that took place either just before the creation of man or shortly afterwards. It might have been before the commencement of the earthly creation. The Bible doesn't give an exact timeline. But I believe the angels were the first of the created order. This means that they were created outside of time since time is a function of the created world. But in any case, God created the angels and one of them named Lucifer rebelled. According to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, Lucifer was the chief angel. He was the most powerful. He was more beautiful than any of the others. And because of his power and because of his beauty, he was prideful and he rebelled against his creator. He thought that he could be God. And from that time, it became his goal to overthrow God. And of course, that meant that God had to remove him from his position as being the chief angel. But when this happened, Lucifer wasn't content to go alone. And you'll notice in verse number four, it says the tail of the dragon drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Angels are often referred to as stars. And so in his rebellion, Lucifer convinced one third of all the angels that they could defeat God. And so they joined him and all of these angels were cast out. These evil angels are known as demons. We don't know how many there are, but they are so numerous that it's really, there's really no point in counting them because there are plenty to do what Lucifer wants them to do. Now here then is the key to the cosmic struggle that all of these angels, including Lucifer, are created beings. There's no created being that could be more powerful than his creator. So Lucifer then is self-deluded. And all these others that went with Satan in this rebellion, they are all following that delusion. So Lucifer convinced them to come under his command and then they could overcome God. But of course that can never happen. But nevertheless, this struggle goes on. It continues until God decides that he will end it and destroy these evil angels forever. So we notice that this dragon, the serpent, Lucifer, the devil, Satan, all of those stand for the, for the same one evil angel. Here he stands before this child, ready to devour it, ready to kill this child as soon as it's born. Why does he? Why does Satan want to do that? Well, because this child born in Israel is the one that God said would crush his head. This is the one who would crush Satan's head and would destroy him. Well, we go back to Genesis to see what God said that he would do to Satan because of the temptation of Adam. He said to Satan in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the woman is Jesus Christ, and although he would go to the cross to die, the Bible describes that as only a slight bruising because Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. And his resurrection was to crush the head of Satan by delivering a fatal blow. And so he will crush the head of Satan like stomping on the head of a snake. Well, then what do you suppose that Satan's number one goal is? Well, his goal is to get Christ before he gets him. He must destroy this child in Israel before the child has a chance to destroy him. And so he stands before the woman who is ready to give birth, ready to kill this child. Now, once again, the pain that the Bible talks about here is the struggle of Israel to bring this child into the world. Now, then we notice, fourthly, Satan vigorously opposes the plan of redemption. He vigorously opposes the plan of redemption. Now, in one sense, you can say that our fate is immaterial to Satan, except that our success is Christ's success. The plan of redemption, you see, is broader in scope than your salvation or mine. In fact, there is an eternal cosmic scope to Christ's plan. 
And that is to return the entire order of creation, not just man, but the entire order of creation to its pristine condition. This means that the only angels that will be left are holy angels. The only men that will be left are holy men. The only earth that will exist is one that does not have the effects of the curse on it. And so when Satan opposes the plan of redemption, what he's actually doing is struggling for self-survival. Destroying the child and us, that is the only way that Satan can preserve himself. And thus we have this cosmic struggle. The history of Israel is one long fight to bring Christ into the world. And because Satan was unable to prevent it, the struggle shifted. He couldn't prevent the birth of Christ, so it shifts, the struggle shifts to overcoming the work of Christ in saving his people and bringing in the kingdom. And that's the reason that Satan blinds minds to the gospel of Christ. It's the reason that you as a Christian find yourself every day struggling against sin. That's the cosmic battle that's going on all the time that's trying to keep you from surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Now let me just briefly relate how that Satan tried to stop God from completing his plans. The Old Testament gives a promise of the Messiah King. That promise is repeated many times in Old Testament history. In fact, there are 1,525 verses in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ's kingdom. I've only got time today to read 1,200 of those. Um, well, really, don't worry. We're going to go fast here. And I'm just going to tell you a few incidents from the Old Testament. Then we're going to look at one primarily from the New Testament that shows Satan's consistency in trying to stop the coming of Christ and trying to prevent him from doing the work that he's, he is called by God to do. Now, the first attempt at stopping the coming of the Savior into the world happened very, very early. This was the attempt against Abel. In Genesis 4, verse number 1, Cain was born. And I want you to listen to the very peculiar nature of the language. Genesis 4, 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Eve said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The indication is that Eve believed that Cain was the promised one of Genesis 3:15. She thought that Cain was the child that would crush the head of the serpent. Now, interestingly, Cain's name means possession. It means something that is prized above everything else. And perhaps that thought had been drilled into Cain's head that he is above everything else so that when Abel was born and God favored Abel, Cain became exceedingly angry and so he killed his brother. Oh, how, how wrong Eve was about Cain. I mean, there, there's an interesting verse in the New Testament that spells out the true character of Cain. 1 John chapter 3, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Abel was the godly one, Cain was from the wicked one. He was the seed of the devil. And so it appeared before the second generation of mankind was over that this promise of the Messiah had already failed. Cain wasn't the one, and Abel, the godly one, was dead. But we remember that God is in control. Adam had another son, and his name was Seth. And there were other sons of Adam, but according to Luke chapter 3, verse number 38, Seth is the one who is in the line of the Messiah. So Seth was the chosen one to bring the Messiah into the world. Well, there is a, another attempt. This is the attempt against Jacob. And this is important because Jacob is the same as Israel. God named him Israel. And his sons are the ones who are the heads of the tribes of Israel. The nation that the woman... Uh, that represents the woman is Israel that gave birth to the child. And so we, we look at this. Did Satan try to kill Jacob? Did he try to do anything in Jacob's life that would, that would end the beginning of Israel, the establishment of that nation, and thus we wouldn't have a Savior? Well, let me give you just a little bit of that story. We read about it in Genesis chapter 27. Now, we know that Abraham was chosen by God. Abraham was an idolater. He didn't know the true God, but he was called by God and he was redeemed and promised that he would be the father of many nations. Abraham had a son named Isaac. 
Isaac is the one who was in the godly line. And then Isaac had two sons. His sons were Esau and Jacob. Jacob was the second born. Jacob was a man of bad character. Jacob was a conniver. His name means supplanter. But strangely enough, Jacob is the one that God chose. And since Esau was the firstborn, he was supposed to receive Isaac's inheritance. But Jacob cheated Esau out of his birthright. And so Esau swore that he would kill Jacob because of this. In Genesis 27, verse 41, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand, then I will slay my brother Jacob. Well, Satan's plan was in place because only Satan puts it into the heart of a man to kill his brother. So Jacob had to flee from Esau because it was Esau's intent to kill him. Well, this, this won't work in God's plan. So God had to stop all of that. And so he changed Esau's heart towards Jacob. And both of these men were tenderly reconciled. And Jacob was the father of 12 sons. They became the tribe's of Israel. Now we can go on through the Old Testament. There are many, many more of these incidents, but I want to take you to one in the Old Testament that sort of has a modern twist to it. This is, this is letter C, the attempt of total extermination. An attempt of total extermination. Now there are many, many attempts to destroy the godly line of the Messiah, and if Satan could kill just one person in the genealogy of Christ, then the promise of the Messiah is dead. So if you go to Matthew chapter 1, for instance, and you pick out just one of the names that are there in the line of Christ, if you pick out Boaz, or you pick out Jesse, you pick out David, pick out Josiah or Zerubbabel, pick out any one of those, and if Satan kills that one person, then the hope of the Messiah is through. And so sometimes that's the way that Satan worked. There's a story in 2 Kings about Joash, one little boy that was providentially saved when all of his brothers were killed. Satan would have killed all the descendants of King Ahaziah except one, and he did. He killed them all except one, and if he could get to just that one, it would have been over, and Satan would have won. Sometimes Satan was out to get just one. But Satan had another tactic, and this was total extermination. He wanted to kill every person in Israel. And I say that the story has a modern feel to it because we all know about Adolf Hitler in World War II and the Holocaust. Hitler tried to destroy the Jews. He wasn't the first to try it. It's also modern because we can look at Israel today and we find them in the midst of a great conflict of, of those in Israel that try to take the nation away from them. We'll gladly see Israel exterminated. That's happening at this very hour. But the same thing happened in the Old Testament in the book of Esther. Esther is a book that was written specifically to deal with an attempt to obliterate Israel and how God providentially spared the entire nation. Now, it's hard to condense that entire story, a powerful story in just a few words, but this is the attempt of Haman to kill the whole nation of Jews. It's not an attempt at killing them like Pharaoh did, remember? Uh, uh, earlier in the Old Testament, uh, as Israel was trying to escape Egypt, the thought of Pharaoh was that he would kill all the male babies, and thus he would stop procreation in Israel. This is different. This is different because this is an attempt to destroy every man, woman, and child in the entire nation. The attempt was by Haman, who was an advisor to the Persian king Ahasuerus. Haman was an Agagite. That's one of the historical enemies of the Jewish people. But little did Haman know that Queen Esther, Ahasuerus' favorite wife, was a Jew, and that Mordecai, her uncle, her bitter uncle, uh, his bitter enemy, rather, was, was Esther's uncle. And to make that, that, story, that story short, Haman's, Haman's plot failed, and Haman was hanged on gallows that he built to hang Mordecai. That's the origin of the saying, hang him high as Haman. It's also the origin of the Jewish Feast of Purim, which is still celebrated today. It's celebrated because Israel was saved when King Ahasuerus gave the Jews permission to defend themselves. Now you can read that whole story in the book of Esther in just a few minutes. 
Esther is the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention God, but God's providence in preserving the Messiah through the Jews is written all over the entire book. So do you see how these stories match what Revelation says? There's this pain that Israel goes through to give birth to Jesus. And there are many, many more attempts because you can read the history and there you find Israel was turned to idolatry. And what God should have done was to forsake the entire nation, let the Babylonians, let the Assyrians destroy them. But instead what God did was to preserve a remnant in Israel, a remnant of believers, so the Messiah would come into this world. The godly seed was preserved. Now let's go on because the story moves into the New Testament. There's more in the Old Testament with that captivity. But in the New Testament, when Jesus finally came into the world, there was an attempt to destroy him. And this brings us to the Christmas story. This is the attempt at Jesus' birth. This is some time between the birth of Jesus and the time that he was two years old. This was when wicked King Herod was visited by the wise men. They told him that they had followed a star, and the star was a sign. A great king had recently been born in Israel. Herod was afraid of any rivals, and so he told the wise men to go and find the child and then return and give him the location so that he could go to the place and worship the child also. The wise men found the house where the young child was, but God warned them that Herod had no intention to worship Christ and would kill him. If he found the location, he would kill Jesus. And so the wise men didn't return to Herod, but they went back to their homes another way. But this infuriated Herod. We just read about that a few minutes ago. Herod was infuriated by it. Turn to Matthew chapter 2 again, and here is recorded one of the worst crimes in human history. This is the kind of carnage that Satan inflicts in this terrible cosmic battle against God and his people. Satan cares nothing for those that he would destroy. So we look at Matthew chapter 2 and in verse number 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. Herod found no way to find Jesus, and so in one fell swoop, he had all the children two years old and under killed. Many people believe that Herod drew a seven to ten mile radius around Jerusalem, and he had all of these little children from birth to toddlers killed. And what does the Bible say about Satan? It says that he was a murderer from the beginning. Satan is consistent. He stopped at nothing to try and kill the Lord's Christ. Now in our text verses at the end of verse number 4, Revelation 12, 4, And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, I'm going to give you just one more, even though we could talk uh, about the numerous times that Christ in his public ministry, Satan tried to kill him. In his hometown of Nazareth, they tried to throw Jesus off a cliff. Satan tempted him to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple. When he taught and healed, there were those that hated him so much that against all good reason, they would have grabbed him and taken his life. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Satan would have killed him if he could. But Jesus prayed for strength from his heavenly Father that he might live to go to the cross. He wanted to live to go to the cross and die there. Satan tried numerous times because he understood the necessity of the cross. If he could kill Christ before the time, he wins. And we wouldn't be here today talking about redemption and the lifting of the curse and cosmic victory over Satan and evil. If Christ had died any other death but the cross, if he uh, had died other than giving himself willingly to the death of the cross, we wouldn't be here today talking about this story. So there were many, many attempts to stop the birth of Christ. And that story has always been the same. Israel travailed to give birth to Christ Satan persecuted God's people in every imaginable way. But the truth is, it was all worth it. 
It was worth it because God blessed Israel. And the greatest blessing on Israel is yet to come. That God will restore them in the coming kingdom. David's throne will be reestablished through Christ. And the dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ will not be one country. It won't be a few countries that surround the Mediterranean. His kingdom will be across the entire world. And the Bible says that all will bow before him. Now the woman pained to bring forth the child, but she did give him birth. Verse number five. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now lastly today, I want you to note the incarnation was the guarantee of salvation. The incarnation was the guarantee of salvation. Verse number five is remarkable when you talk about brief overviews. This would be the ultimate. This verse skips over the perfect life of Christ. It skips over the cross. It says nothing about three days in the tomb. There's nothing here about a resurrection. There's nothing here about 2,000 years of church history. None of that is mentioned in the verse. But it does mention the ascension. Now, when we preach Christ, we, we talk about his birth, we talk about the life, we talk about his death, and certainly we talk about the resurrection. But somehow, lost in the shuffle, it seems that when we preach Christ, we really never say much about the ascension, do we? Not much is said about the ascension of Christ. But I can assure you the Holy Spirit doesn't forget it. Because presently, Jesus Christ is waiting in heaven for his coronation. The woman delivered the child. And God was incarnate, and the incarnation made a perfect sacrifice for sin possible. Christ couldn't be our Savior. He couldn't impute to us his perfect obedience unless he came to this earth and submitted to God's law. Galatians says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So the incarnation is the allowance of the gospel. Paul said Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he arose the third day according to the scriptures. But what does the incarnation mean for us? Let me give you two promises that come out of the incarnation. The first is that there is a promise of a redeemer. A promise of a redeemer. We read this in Genesis 3.15. It's the proto-evangelium. The first gospel. God cursed the earth, but he promised that the curse would be lifted through the incarnation, the seed of the woman. Now in the Garden of Eden then, we see a view of God's grace. The gospel is the gospel of grace because man couldn't redeem himself. And so what God did, he said, I will bring salvation to the world. And this theme of redemption runs throughout the entire Bible, starting in Genesis, going all the way to Revelation, and the theme is always God will bring redemption. And each of the examples that I gave you of Satan's attacks and of man's willingness and eagerness to be Satan's pawns, all that is a testimony to the grace of God and his determination to redeem. Because looking at what we have done, what the world has done, what Satan has done, what every person has done, there is no cause for God to redeem. None. None found in us. It's only because of his mercy, his love, and his grace that we have a Savior. Satan couldn't kill the Redeemer, and thus he couldn't kill salvation. Only thing that he can do is to inflict pain on us for a time. He can only bruise the heel of the Messiah, but Christ will crush his head. Now next is the promise of a ruler. Here's the best news that you'll hear today. Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back. The incarnation means that there's a ruler that will sit on the throne of David forever. Verse 5 says, he'll rule the nations with a rod of iron. And this is talking about the millennial kingdom when Christ will come to sit on an everlasting throne. And it will be a kingdom of perfect peace. And then he will have the final victory over sin and Satan. 
Then the old dragon will be cast out into outer darkness, into the lake of fire. All the demons will join him there. But that's not all. Don't just think about demons that will be in hell. Don't just think about Satan who will be in hell. It's also true that all unrepentant sinners, all those who are against God, will also suffer the vengeance of the Almighty God. At the end, sin and Satan are gone. At the end, the demons are gone. And at the end, evil men are gone. At the end, the cosmic battle is over and it's won by the man-child who is born of the woman. Final victory comes to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. Heaven is assured because the woman gave birth to the child. John looked into heaven he saw the eternal scope of Christmas. He saw the battle that raged between good and evil. He saw this battle between God and Lucifer. He saw the pains of Israel struggling to bring the Messiah into the world. And then he saw God's success. God will never be defeated. He wants you to be saved. And thus a child was born. Because of this, the world has hope. The child was born and every Christmas we are reminded the child was born and if I have to tell that same story the same way a thousand times it never gets old a child was born thank God for his mercy and grace it was his child that was born let's pray thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park California if you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Berean Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Rohnert Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.